The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. If a person does not contemplate prophecy, they really are doing themselves an injustice because prophecy is the Lord telling us exactly what's going to take place. He's also telling us what's going to be useless in the future. He's conveying so many things to us, and if one does not contemplate those prophecies, they could wind up doing something in vain. And you see, I, I have a concern about doing anything in vain. I don't want to do anything that's not going to help somebody else or edify those who believe in Jesus Christ. Because in my mind, those who believe in Jesus Christ are my true brothers and sisters, and I owe them a debt of love. I owe that because I accept fully what Jesus Christ did for me. It's a wonderful thing to behold, but it's also heartbreaking when you look back on it, knowing your condition prior to accepting the Father, and then seeing the blessings He gives you afterward. And I'm not talking about stuff blessings. You see, one of the greatest blessings to me is His revelation. That's a great blessing. For Him to give you understanding of what He's saying, that's a great blessing. You can achieve everything else under your own uh, earthly power. But you cannot understand the Word of God completely without Him interceding, giving you revelation. And that's my true blessing. That's one of my true blessings. That brings me joy to understand what He's saying, because then I can help more. And it's not in vain. I don't like to do things in vain. I tend to look at the spiritual aspects of ISIS, what their goal is spiritually, what's driving them spiritually. And most importantly, is that same mentality they carry it throughout the entire earth. As I contemplate those things, it reminds me of one scripture, and it's this one. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. They will soon release some writings of Noah, who did receive some more things, and they've been hiding these books. You see, the books that they really hide are the same books that edify Jesus Christ. In these writings, it specifically says, the four mighty men, or the four men who expelled the Nephilim, this is written down in, in more than one spot. Now, hear me, we know that Michael, Gabriel, uh, Uriel, and Raphael were responsible for expelling the Nephilim. These same individuals will hold back both fires and winds. Nothing will stir upon the earth. In the daytime, nothing will move. In the nighttime, nothing will move. And do you know what that's for based on these texts? It specifically states that the tribes of the earth, those who are clean, the clean ones of the tribes of the earth, have taken flight, and that's the reason why everything stopped. And you know what? A lot of people contest everything I'm about to say, but I enjoy the criticisms. But when the Lord puts something in my stubborn heart, it just it won't leave. My heart won't leave, and nothing leaves. It just stays there. It makes me ponder. And then it does more than make me ponder. There's a faith behind it. And I can honestly say when the Lord does this to me, it comes to pass, and I'm the dummy if I don't pay attention to it. If I didn't listen to that dream I had in February concerning Russia and the Islamic troops, that nobody could see me because they were in that huge hangar. And listen, a lot of... I'm, I'm still waiting on Russia's Navy. There's going to be a large-scale naval operation, I'm telling you, based on that dream. Even when I told you guys that the president, vice president, turned their backs on the entire situation and walked away in arrogance, and then the trouble came. Do you see what's happening in the Middle East? And what did our government do? What did they do? What did our leadership, the commander-in-chief, was advised not to do anything? In fact, at first, they thought ISIS based off intelligence it was nothing. Just a group of people trying to prove a point. Now they see the forces build and the spiritual impact they have. They can't fight faith. No one can fight faith. The only way to fight faith, especially for a person who believes, if they die in combat or war or killing infidels, they go to heaven. The only way to combat that is to do the unthinkable. You cannot compromise with these folks. You cannot sit down and have talks with these folks. They're not going to work like that. I think that's becoming painfully obvious to a great many people. 
They're not going to listen. They're going to use everything that they have to leverage. They do not trust anything of the Western world. Yet, even they, the usurpers in the Middle East, are not heeding the warnings in the Middle East. Yes, there are warnings. And when the water completely dries up in the rivers in the Middle East, it's over. It was all throughout the Bible, through deeper studies, a lot of prayer, and to kick out these preconceived notions that other men had talked about, or that I may have heard, I had to see clearly. It took a fast. Sometimes I'll fast because I'm troubled by what I'm reading. It doesn't sit right in my spirit. And so I'll have to fast for clarity, which means cutting everything. I'll starve the flesh so it shuts out. Flesh makes too much noise. Things don't come through clearly. You try to focus on the Bible and you start instantly thinking about problems things of that nature, so I had to cut it off. Anyway, back to what I was saying. All these things in the Bible are building, coming to pass, are absolutely true. Men have tried to cover up things. Men have thrown in their philosophies to the Word of God. I hear people talking about prophecy, and I can hear the tone, and something is not sitting right in their soul. You see, internally in their spirit, they know the truth. They can't quite put it to words, or they face deep opposition from everybody else. Well, guess what? I advise those people, don't be pressured by everybody else. Say what the word, say what the Lord has placed upon your heart. Go and study. Immerse yourself in the word. Walk in the spirit fast until you get your answer. Because what you've been given is likely important for the body of Christ. Cut off the bodies crying. The flesh can surely stand against you. You know, Daniel did that. When Daniel Daniel needed an answer, he, he had a vision that just didn't sit well with him. And he chastened the flesh, which means he didn't eat or drink anything to make his flesh be quiet. The moment he began to do that, the moment he set his heart to do that, Gabriel, one of the divine messengers, was sent to give him, give him an answer. See, once you set your heart to do something, that means you really want it. And as we discussed prior, we can't fool God in any way. We can speak 10 billion words. God knows the heart. Our words, we can say everything, but the heart can be crying for something else. And the Lord can see right through us. But when they align, when your words and your heart align in honesty and integrity and in truth, answers do come. People have philosophies and differences, but guess what? There are things happening that are adding clarity to prophecy. And because they're not, like people thought they would be, it's going to shake up a few folks. I had a thought like this man of perdition everyone's looking for, not to be confused with the beast system. You see, a great many people get that mixed up. There's the first beast, which consists of seven kings, five are fallen, one is, one is not yet. He's coming, the man of perdition. Even he is the eighth. Scripture is like, they will behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is and will wonder whose names are not written in the book of life and the foundations of the earth. Also, the seven heads of the beast are the seven mountains on which, I'll call it the harlot, sits. By the way, that word in Revelation 17, 8, do you understand that in its literal translation it means this, the seven heads are the seven mountains on which the wife sits. What wife on which the wife sits? I had to dig a little deeper to find out why they use the word harlot. Well, it's a special character they use that can turn a wife into a harlot, but the root word is still wife. She was married. Now, I know a lot of people don't like this, but there's only one nation that was ever married to God. Only one. No other nation was joining him in that way. No other nation was joining him in that way. You see, her adultery is of an ancient adultery, but something else happened. Hear me, something else happened. There was another nation that came, her daughter, that took up her belief first. There was a daughter. She had a daughter. Anybody know who the daughter is? She had a daughter. There is a daughter of Babylon. She had a daughter. And the daughter is going to be wiped away. Yet the wife will be chastened and redone. No one's going to get rid of the wife. Not one person's going to get rid of the wife. She may go through some things, but she's not... No one's going to get rid of her. But there was another daughter, a mystery daughter that didn't exist at the time, which is why it was a mystery. 
It didn't exist. You see, I had to look back, and they knew all the provinces of the region. They knew all the provinces of the region. But there's one nation they never knew. They did not know America. So America takes up that religion in truth. And then America, too, stopped looking to God and began to look in other directions, looking after other gods, committing fornication. We're the ones with all the merchandise and this, that, and the other. See, I had to go back and clarify because that word Babylon was used quite a few times in Revelation. I was like, surely there has to be a special character on the word Babylon, this, that, and the other. To define, is it different than the first Babylon? Sure enough, it was. Babylon's not written the same in every case. Yet Babylon is the root word. So I found that interesting. I had to do some digging because some things don't settle right in this. Now we know, we know for a fact that Babylon, as it was described, everybody wanted to go to Babylon, right? Everybody wants to come to America. We can feel on our bones it's one and the same. But I was thinking, how in the world can you have two or three Babylons? That's impossible. And so we're dealing with mystery Babylon. Then we're dealing with spiritual Babylon or spiritual Sodom and Egypt. Spiritual Sodom and Egypt, which is also in the translated word. I don't know why they did that. Maybe the Lord wanted us to get nosy so we can get the full truth. That's also going to come out of the way, come out. So anyway, we have two nations, is what I'm telling you, Israel and America. America will likely be the last stronghold, but it too is going to get us surprised because they're arrogant. And I have to pay attention to what the Lord sends me. I don't have silly dreams. You know, some people have silly dreams. I have silly dreams. I examine, test my dreams because if they don't line up with the Word of God, I get rid of them. Period. I don't care how convincing it seems, but I don't want to be fooled. You don't want to be fooled. And I asked the Lord, I said, listen, Lord, now I'm talking to people. If you allow me not to identify something false, they're going to fall. And if I believe in something that's not true and give it to them, and you didn't stop me or warn me after my full submission, chastening of my own flesh, I said, they're going to lose faith in you. I did. I most certainly did. In this day and age, it it does not pay for you to get my insight. It pays that the word of the Lord come alive for you. That's what's going to pay. You need the word of the Lord to be alive within you so that you too can go to the word. And it is a living word so that you can be armed to walk through this time. You know, some of this time is not going to be about war, but massive spiritual oppression. You need to trust in scriptures like the fragment, no harm will come nigh thy dwelling. You need to be rooted and grounded in the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because anything else will not do. I don't know how how much more urgent I can be on this. Things are becoming explosive in the Middle East. You have people dying already. It's not a joke. And listen, America has been spoiled for so long. We've been spoiled for so long that most of our anger and hatred is toward each other. I'm asking you, stop doing that. Do not turn your emotions internally, but put them back in order. Begin to look at the world globally. Make sure you're exercising charity right there where you are. Begin at that process. Don't destroy a person to edify another person. Stop doing that. What we have to do, despite how difficult it may be, the Lord is presenting all of us with a choice. It's almost like he walked us directly into a compromise. And he's saying, now what are you going to do? Balance everything out. I want to see what you're going to do. Now make the choice, because I want to see what you're going to do. All of us have been walked into the same thing, because there's a time coming that is not usually defined. People can feel it in their souls, and it's almost like the Lord is holding back a piece of their understanding so that when it comes, it will be so urgent, so true, it will shake you to your soul and you won't be able to deny it is true. It's going to be a call for you and for everybody else to go, not just to pick up and leave somewhere, but a call for you to actually walk in a way you've not done before. Every time I begin to think about it, I, I, I tend to feel people will walk into the rain not just normal rain either. People will walk into a rain that washes them and fills them up. There will be things stripped away from you because the spirit will outweigh the stuff of the flesh at that time. So you have to be in position to receive it. 
Are you really in position to receive the Spirit pouring out on all flesh? Honestly, truthfully, are you in a position? Because hear me, if a small piece of the Spirit pours out now, and we have not subdued our flesh enough to still operate in truth and with integrity, not compromising on anything, operating with humility and meekness and love, unconditional love, we, if we can't do that, well, then it's up to us on an individual basis to seek just a little harder. Where are we investing our time? What is our time invested in? Think about this one. I'm going to give you a scenario. There's a hail maid. A hail maid that you have to move out of your house. Hear this whole scenario. You know you have to move, but it's not. You have a year to move. Let's just say you have a year to move. Most people won't do anything the first day. It'll sink in after five or six days. You know what they do after five or six days when they meditate on the thought that they have to move? Nothing. They sit there. They go about their daily business as though they don't have to move. As it comes down and you're 90 days out from moving, something happens to you. You begin to look around at the old house and you have a new appreciation of something. Why? Because you're about to lose it. You begin to look around and see how much you took for granted. Why? Because you're about to lose it. But you're just looking. You're not preparing. When it comes 30 days out, you begin to prepare and pack. But you're preparing and packing, sweating. You're nervous. You don't know what's next or anything else. Because you failed to, to cram everything in there. Now, your countenance is not good. You're tired. You're frustrated. You're irritated. Your feelings are not too good. And then something else happens. You feel you're being forced out of your home, that you're being stripped of everything. Now, you got the warning a year ago, but because you did nothing for the first three quarters of that year, now you're in a time crunch to get out. And at the very end, some may get out. Some fail the challenge because they give up. This is what happens when no one takes their allotted time to prepare for something like that. You know you have to move. Now, I want to ask you a question based on that scenario. How many of us, over the many years in our lives, even right now, how many of us have allotted our time to preparation for what the prophecies are actually saying? And how many are doing nothing, saying, I need more proof, therefore I can't prepare? Because the proof you're seeking is going to come out right at the door. And if you don't want to shake, rattle, and roll out to be one of those ones who fall away, you need to prepare now. This is why you guys will never hear me complain about time. Most people say, oh, I need the Lord to come right now, right now. I'm ready to go. But the truth is, if we were ready to go right now, the Lord would call us home. We're not ready. We're not ready yet. But we need to get ready. Take the prophecies as truth and not simply words of something like a movie. It's real. It's forming. And I, for one, don't want you to be caught off guard because you need to have the prophecies in your head and prepare for them truthfully. Not just say that was a good, that was a pretty good session and do nothing. Don't do that. What do you think happens to the Christians who lived in Iraq, who read the same prophecies we do? And they're in the region that it's talking about and they did nothing. Listen, they're Christians and they didn't do anything until it was at the door. Then they're absolutely distraught. A watchman will not be that way because a watchman will watch and he will tell you they're coming, something is wrong. Anybody in leadership will say, hey, quit sitting on the couch. Get up and do this or that. The spirit of the living God will never, ever lie to you. The Holy Spirit will never, ever lie to you. True discernment will never, ever be wrong. We're wrong all the time. But those things that come from above are perfect and without regret. They're never, ever wrong. Normally, when people are wrong in their judgments, they lean them to their own understanding. And if you do that, you just let God right out of it. We have an ample amount of time to prepare, but I'm telling you, the allotted time that we once had is being cut short. Do you understand what it said? That the Lord cut time short. Because if he had, no flesh would have been saved. If he cut time short, then the time everybody is in expectation of has been moved up which means time can no longer be calculated.
because God shut, he cut the time short. I see a lot of people with Daniel's timeline. I went through Daniel myself and said, Lord, what's the relevancy of giving all these years and so forth? Then in prayer, I got a clear answer. I want you to know the season. I don't want you to know the exact time. I want you to know the season. Then I was reminded of a scripture when Jesus rebuked some folks because they could discern the four seasons we had, but they could not discern the seasons of God, the time of which he came. He wasn't happy with them. Are you all aware of that? Jesus was not happy with them because they could not discern the seasons. He also further warned us and said, watch, because if you don't want no trouble, you're going to be in trouble. I'm paraphrasing, of course. That season and the time we've been given each day has been precious, instrumental in the development of us. But there's a new season that has begun. I'm not qualified to interpret prophecy for you. I can tell you that now. I am qualified to tell you some strange things that you 100% will see. It's my hope, my prayer, that you're ready for all of them. Not the weird things like the lights in the sky. I believe that you all can get past that because it's already beginning, and I, and I know you can get past that. That's not the bother. The bother are the uncontrollable masses. While you can handle a situation, others may not, and they're going to come find you for answers because you've been identified as the one in your family that talked about Jesus too much. You're the one that's been identified in your family as the one that relies on Jesus and who continually says Jesus can fix this and that. And when things begin to happen, they're going to find you. They're going to want answers. They're not going to look to the news. They're going to look to you. Because what's going to happen and transpire based on these scriptures is not conventional. It will defy the wisdom of every... Listen, it says the nations were distressed with perplexity. They are distressed with massive confusion. No one's going to, if they're distressed with massive confusion, by the way, that's identifying the people, massive confusion, they're, they're not going to traditional means of finding out information. It'll be too hard to search on YouTube to find an answer because so many people have gotten on YouTube and made up stuff where they have different opinions. And so when they see it in front of their faces, they're not going to want to know what they are so much as who can save me from this. There will be a great many who fall away, but there will also be a great many who come to you. You've been in the Word long. People will be led to you because you're known among those around you. You'd be shocked. You know, the first time I went to combat, I didn't tell anybody about my beliefs. Nobody knew about my beliefs. Do you know what happened in combat? They, they began to come to me saying, what really happens to me? If I die, this was a deep concern of theirs. And it came to me, I didn't discuss anything with them. But I'm telling you now, people watch what you do. See, a lot of people can determine if you're a Christian based on your day-to-day -day activities. They came to me and said, what happens to me if I really die? Now, can you imagine, I didn't speak to these folks. I didn't tell them I was a Christian. Yet they still came to me asking, what really happens if I die? Prior to that, they weren't talking about Christianity. They were talking about everything but good stuff. What they were going to kill. This, that, and the other. When it came down to it, they needed to know. This is what's going to happen. When the vice of safety is taken away from the world. When those things that have kept things hidden allow things to be released. They're coming to you. And you're a direct representative of the kingdom. You're a direct representative of the kingdom. So what you do in public is what you're teaching others, how they observe you, how they look at you. You're approving or disapproving things because they see you as an ambassador to the kingdom. That's another thought to keep in your head. And so we need to stand 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If we say we believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then let us let the world go, all of it. They see us. For some of the people who use the title of, you know what, most of the world does not trust the title of Christian. Even that word has become an offensive word, a word that does not mean anything to anybody anymore. Now they're looking at how a person conducts themselves. How you conduct yourself is everything. And believe me, once it's deeply in your heart, 
you'll begin to see things that you do before anybody else sees and that's a good thing because see the father's listening in my belief that right now everyone is being watched to see who's counted worthy the faith of the people it would appear is sealed and the markings have begun people may not know if they've been marked or not people may not know they're being watched right now some will be worthy to escape all the bad things in prophecy and some will not this I do know I know this and this goes against a lot of things but you know what Jesus said until Israel says blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord they're gonna have to endure all of it you see Israel hasn't listen you have to use your 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 you need to understand the scripture on this Israel went through the Holocaust the nation Israel is not going anywhere however it's been destroyed multiple times they came back they went through the Holocaust they were an object of offense to everybody yet they came back the last thing they're going to go through is 42 months of being trampled down by the Gentile because it says the Lord looked down upon his land and had pity upon the people he looked down upon his land and had pity for the people that land is his that land is sanctified and anybody who does anything on that land check mark destroy but here are the facts just like there are good people and bad people in the United States there are good people and bad people in Israel Israel will be purged of those bad people if the Lord looks down upon his land and pities the people they're in bad shape number one and he's coming back to do some changes number two they have to be here until the very end are you aware of that you see the Lord said the first to be last and last to be first the greatest is the least and the least is the greatest the word was given to his people first then it came to us you think they would be saved first but they're not because the last will be first everybody outside of them something's going to happen you didn't expect and this is why I don't debate about subjects like the one that says then they will be caught up in the clouds because if you rightly define the word of truth you begin to see something you begin to see something very curious something over and over and over again you begin to see that Israel has to be here to the very end and the prophecies declare that but you also see that something happens to all the other folks some happens to them what happened to them that will be revealed in time one thing we know for sure according to the Bible the dead will rise first but even before that there will be a great falling away and after there's a great falling away the man of perdition is revealed then the dead will raise and those which are alive will be caught up in the air now if we go back to the book of Daniel which is where I want to take you it is defined Daniel chapter 12 listen close and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book of life and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament let me stop you on that scripture so you don't think it's just you know oh they're going to be uh, they're going to be deemed good folks so it's not what that means because if you go back if, if you listen this is also referenced in the book of Enoch by the way it was said that those that are wise those who were spreading the gospel their countenance will be like the Sun no mortal flesh will be able to look upon them it'll burn their eyeballs out that's what it says in the book of Enoch it says Jesus in the brightness of his coming will be like that too it says we don't know what we're gonna be but we know we shall be like him are, are you getting what I'm saying flesh will not be able to look upon you then do you understand this what, what's going to happen do you understand and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever it's all about brightness it's all about the change but who was Daniel given this answer concerning listen Daniel prayed for something specific anybody know what it was anybody know what Daniel prayed for he prayed for his people what will become of my people that's what he prayed for and so you see if you put this in context and then if you go back to Revelation 
Let's go to Revelation. Knowing that Israel, number one, has to be in that tumultuous time. They have to be in that tumultuous time. Michael stands up at that time and everybody's delivered. But it says the time in which he stands up is in a time of trouble that never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. They're in a lot of trouble. This was Daniel concerning his people. Israel will be in a lot of trouble. Can you understand that? They will be in a lot of trouble. So then you ask yourself, Lord, okay, he gave this to Daniel. He's speaking in regards to his people. Do we apply this to everybody? Then we go to Revelation. Once we go to Revelation, we see something else. In fact, in the Gospels, we see something else. Nobody wants to figure it out. So when we go to Revelation, we find this curious scripture. Seven, Revelation 7, chapter 9 says, And after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. That's what they were saying. Then it was asked of John, John, do you know who these are? I'm in 13 and 14. And John says, Sir, thou knowest. Then the angel said, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The great multitude you see standing at the throne, they came out of great tribulation. They're not there anymore. Yet you continue to read the remaining parts of Revelation and you see something else that in the land, because Babylon is gone, but near and about the land of Israel, people are being beheaded, overcoming the devil from the word of their testimony. It is about that place. It is about that place. But see, if you rightly divine the word of truth, it did not say all lands will be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. Even when it says the beast shall wear out the saints of the Most High, I went and looked at that too. And it had an attached phrase to it, the original text, the origination phrase. And then Jesus said there will be a time of trouble, like that too, in Matthew. But then he said something curious himself. He said, then shall two people be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in an hour, as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now I got two things from this scripture. If he comes in an hour that we think not, why are people so preoccupied defining the very day he's coming? If he comes in an hour we think not, that's like a key word to say he's not coming on any Jewish holiday. Because that would be an hour people would think he was coming with him on one of the Jewish holidays. That means he's not. He's coming in an hour. We think not. Nobody reads this scripture. Nobody certainly applies it because every time you see someone come up with an idea, Jesus is coming back on such and such Jewish holiday. But he specifically said he's coming in an hour, we think not, which means if he comes in an hour or people have an expectation of it. Somebody made a mistake, didn't they? Didn't they? But we know our Father's perfect does not make mistakes. We also know that time is being cut short. And by time being cut short, he's coming sooner than people can calculate he's coming. In other words, he's coming out of season. He's going to come out of season. And if a person is not ready, they're going to be a world of mess. If they think he delayed his coming, like in 48, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, he shall begin to smite his fellow servants, listen, and to eat and drink with drunken, the Lord of that servant, shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour he think he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him to his portion with the hypocrites. He shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, here's something that comes out of here. A hypocrite, living a dual life, playing in the world and playing church. A hypocrite. Oh, boy. He just told us where they're going. Because in 51, it said, He shall cut them asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A hypocrite's not going to the kingdom. If you if you are both hot and cold, you are lukewarm. See, to be lukewarm, you have to mix hot and cold together. And you're lukewarm. See how that works? It's a serious walk. 
when you look at it from the world perspective because you say to yourself, well, not, let me cut out the kid stuff. But see, what you don't know is this. Once you become for Jesus, once you become that new man, new creature, and it begins to grow inside of you, you can't help but to seek his word. You can't help it. You, there's, you just can't help it. Your desires change and everything else, you cannot help it. You really don't care what anybody says about you. You still have to go into his word. You can't help yourself. The word becomes a part of you then. It is your food. You can't go 20 days without the word. You'll start falling apart and you know it. It's a beautiful thing. But for some people, as the example I gave you about that house they have to leave, they begin to marvel at every corner, piece of construction and everything in the house. And they realize in the house how bad they need to keep it. Now I can tell you what that example of the house was. That house was us living in the world. Us having to move are the prophecies coming true, which is your deliverance. It's your deliverance. But some people are going to begin to marvel at their own lives and the comfort that they had. And they're going to desire that comfort, just like Lot's wife looking back on Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did she look back in the first place? Why did she look back if it were not in her heart that she missed something about that place? You only look back when you miss something about that place. Some people say, oh, I just have to have one last look. You, you want that last look because you actually like what you left. Some people like the world trying to find something for you, something you can purge from your system. Some people like the world, period. But you know what? The Lord is merciful. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of patience. And he knows that some of us have attachments to this world. But he's also the God who sees us all the time, El Roy. And so what we have to do is be real about this walk. We have to be real because very real things are happening. What people are being exposed to both spiritually is also manifesting. Keeping your mind that you've all, listen, by the blood of the Lamb, things are overcome for you. You didn't overcome it. The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony is overcoming. Now, that's very important for you to know. You of yourself cannot overcome spiritual opposition. But with the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, there is nothing you cannot overcome. You've already overcome. You see, Jesus overcame the devil for you already. So don't let him trick you into not moving or doing anything. When I say move, like go, go out there, go speak to that person that he laid upon your heart. When he sends someone to you, which he has to most of you in here, he has sent someone to you curious about the Bible. And they throw one of these side curves at you and instantly you may have taken offense. You've rid of that spirit of offense so that you can work. People are noticing the ocean floor lit up, full of dancing lights in the ocean floor. They're also noticing things leaving Earth. Pilots are, they don't speak about it. Passengers are. They really don't like to speak about it. See, when you start talking about that, Satan says, ooh, don't go there. Satan is saying this. Don't go there. Satan says, don't go there. Then you'll be ridiculed. Who cares if he ridicules anybody? But you see, I can't shake it out of my hard-headed mind that the beast system is not conventional based on what I've been seeing over the years. It is not conventional. It is spiritually led. The Mahdi is an entity that's absolutely real. Some of those pits over there will make you vomit just by getting close to them. You will get lightheaded and everything else. Everybody can't walk into these tight mist that comes out of nowhere. Now, a lot of people say, ooh, well, that's, you know, that's ghost story stuff. Okay. When the Mahdi rises and when his speech begins to penetrate a person's thoughts and everything else, because they didn't prepare, they're going to be scared or submit. You're going to do two things. Be, you're going to be frightened to death or you're going to submit. I'm not going to be either. I'm going to say, well, the Lord said this was coming. I'm mentally prepared for this. Let me keep walking. Don't be soon shaken by what you'll see in the earth. And certainly don't be an expert on what does not exist in the earth. You're protected all the way around. You see, you have to know you're protected all the way around. Believe me, if they could get to you, they would have done so. Okay? They can't get to you. You're still here. The only thing they can do is make you get yourself. They'll whisper in your ear. They'll make you have selective listening. Now, this is a big one, and I'm, I wrote this down so I wouldn't miss it. Satan has a habit of making you have selective listening. Let me tell you what that is. You're talking to someone, 
but you have a problem or you have an emotional overtone to your life. You're talking to someone, instantly you take offense to something they said. Well, the fact is that Satan took control of your hearing. He didn't let you hear the entire thing, but he amplified the portion he wanted you to hear so that you would run away from the entire thing. That's called selective listening, listening to certain portions of a sentence. Two people get in arguments. And if you examine both and record their conversation, I've done this before, you record the argument, neither one of them knows the exact things that they can't hear the whole argument. They couldn't even hear what they were saying. They'll say, I never said that, but it's on a recording. The other person says, well, I didn't say that either. I heard her say such and such. Well, she never said that. Well, how do you know it's recorded? You know, we sat and did this on purpose just to prove a point. That when you're angry like that, Satan is working over time within you. He can take control of your flesh. That's what happens. You give him control of your flesh. He'll make you have selective listening. He'll bring every foul thing to your mind of the, the thing that the other person did, every accusation, into supernatural knowledge of the other person's faults come into mind and everything else. It's almost like he reaches down at the residue of desires within you, the bad ones, and he resurrects them and amplifies them. Then he manipulates your brain so that you only perceive anything against you, anything for you, you can't perceive it. Listen, that's real. That's not a joke. That's absolutely real. Satan works this way. And the worst part is you can't see him yet. So let me ask you a question. If he can do that and stay hidden, what do you think is going to happen with him? One third of the fallen angels, which by the way could represent trillions of angels, we don't know. And they have the mental capacity to re resurrect that rotten residue within a person. Those bad angels have a habit of resurrecting the residue of evil desires within any human being. All throughout the Gospels, the Lord is constantly saying, subdue your flesh, purge yourself, get rid of this, get rid of that, because he already knew the battle that would come. The next deluge will not be water. It's going to be the angels, a deluge of angels, of fallen angels. It took 200 to disrupt this earth so bad, God destroyed it with water. What do you think one-third is going to do when they fall to earth? They, the angels themselves can go around killing people, but they corrupted everything about it. Everything about earth, they corrupted. The next day will be of those fallen angels coming to earth. Whether in physical or spiritual form, it does not matter. They're going to influence everything. Are you ready for that? Do, you even, do some of you even know that? We read those scriptures like one-third of the angels fall to earth with Satan. And we take it for granted. They're coming. But something is going to happen prior to that time. Yes, we'll talk about that later in the week. Something marvelous. You see, nothing can come to you unless you've been prepped to handle it. In order for you to be fully guarded against fallen angels, you have to be overtaken by the Spirit of God. You have to be overtaken. You have to be full of it. Full of the Spirit of God will be all over you. But it's only coming to those who are His. It's not coming to those in the world. That's why they hated God, blasphemed Him, and cursed Him, and everything else. But these days are lining up. These days are lining up. Now, having given all that strange stuff and, and, and preparatory thoughts that you have, the most beautiful part of it all is all of this is happening for your sake. You see, everything has to be purged for your new world. The dodos of the world say new world order. God said, heaven and earth have passed away. Behold, a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to make all things new. I had a strange dream when I was a kid. I told my mother about it. Because it bothered me. And I kept asking her, is the earth going to split in two? And she said, well, what are you talking about? I said, is, are there two earths or is it just one earth? She said, it's just one. In the dream, I saw that I saw an earth come out of the earth. One earth was untouched. The other earth was in shambles. I, for one thing, it's important to really get prophecy in your heart so that you're aware. You have to be aware. And see, that's why I respect those men who talk about prophecy. Not so much the theology or ideologies behind prophecy, but think about prophecy itself. Because with it, you will understand that there are attacks against prophecy. You're going to understand that 
these things that are rising are trying to put a partition between you and Jesus Christ. You would also understand that the attack is against you. Do this by taking a social happening, but they purposely alter the outcome in the public events because they don't want you to trust anybody connected to prophecy or Christianity. If you don't know that right now, if, if you don't really know that right now, get that tonight. Because when it happens, they're going to try to nullify anything anybody says about prophecy. Okay, yes, I was talking about the two Earths. Now, when I was a kid, I did. I asked my mother whether there two Earths. The dream was so real that I saw the Earth split in two. One of the Earths that was ruined, and the moon and all the planets too, went straight into a void. It looked like a void. And the people were just in distress in this void. That's where they were. The other Earth was untouched. It was much, much bigger. But it was not the only one I saw, because after the, it, it would appear that the new one was spawning other Earths all over the place. It was strange. But I do know that the one Earth was destroyed, and this was prior to me knowing that the Lord said, He'll establish a new heaven and a new earth, because the old heavens and the old earth will pass away. When I had that dream, you can almost see the end of things, almost see the end. But I found that dream intriguing, because it was the first dream to let me know that there is an ending to all of this, and there is a new beginning. That's what I extracted out of that dream. That's what I could feel within me, but I could never put it to words. There will be a new beginning and a new ending. And you know what? With that, when you trust in the prophecies, knowing that we get the full victory, you begin to realize the steps in your life, every time you fell, you had to fall to get to the point where you're at because God knows us individually. He knows what it takes to get us where we need to be. What works for me won't work for you. What works for you will not work for me. All of us work differently. We're independent individuals. And so he's taking great care in formulating your life to get you right here. I'm amazed. I'm blown away. Because if you think with a, with a strange mind like mine, and you say, well, their parents had to meet at such and such time, but even before then, generational lines had to be established. Genes had to be perfect and pass through to get to you, to form you. So that when, your, when you became a living soul here on earth, his design would be permanent and everything will be set up into your life so that you can have the victory. It's all about your victory. It's all about you being a victor. You've done the other part. You've been in captivity. You were maimed. You were a victim. Through the course of your life, he's shown you true healings. He's given you true sight. You're beginning to learn the word victory. You know what deliverance is. Your life had to be that way to get you there. That means he cares about you deeply. That means if he cares about you, he is also assured something you couldn't possibly imagine. And when he assures his children of something, and all he says is this, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. That's our choice. We have a choice of who we serve. Every decision you make in your life, everything you do, you're serving one of two kingdoms. The question is, will you serve the kingdom containing the Father that loves you the most, or serve the kingdom that stands against the Father, which will eventually be burnt up in the end? That's the question in everything you do. I don't know about you, but I want to be an authentic person, full of integrity, even when no one is looking. When no one could ever find out, I want to do the right thing by him, not by my own knowledge, but by him. I want to walk as he prescribed me to walk. Because the more I read, the more I do walk like that. And you know what? It's very simple. The more I walk like he said to walk, the more I see his word come to pass, comes to pass. You know what that builds? That builds trust. That builds a trust this world can't take away. You see, my hopes are not in the world. That's why I'm never let down. There's no way I can be let down from anything in the earth. Now, a lot of you can't say that. If you can be let down by something, your hope has been in it. My hope is in the Lord. So the world can't let me down. If you're with another person or have people around you, and you've ever said, they let me down, you know what you need to do? Stop putting your hope in things that can change 
Put your hope in something that cannot change. Put your hope in something solid. Stop putting it in people. Because when your hope is broken in people, you sit, you point at them. You did it. You did it. Stop doing that. How long is it going to take for you to put your hope into God and the things of God? Is your hope in your salvation? Is your hope in His promises concerning you? Because if you're putting your hope in your job and in things around you and in people around you, they're going to let you down every single time. I see parents do this with their children. They get really let down because a child, and, and you know what, my colleagues, well, all of us, I, I guess you could say that uh, we like things squared away. We like things in order. There's no way in the world I can ever expect anybody to keep up with my standards. So if they fail to do that, certainly with children, it doesn't move me to the left or to the right. Because I know they have to learn a standard, but they're not going to perfect it. My hope is not in them perfecting a standard, certainly not one that I gave, because you know what that is? That means I'm a dictator. That's what that means. And then I'm the one that's going to end up with a headache. Don't expect anyone to keep your standards. Encourage them to keep the standards written in the Word. See, if you expect someone to keep your standards, they're also going to let you down. That's two letdowns. One, because you had hope in them, and they change from day to day. Two, but if you expect someone to keep your standards, that will never happen either. It's not going to happen. There's a way to walk with joy, but you're going to have to take your hope out of the things of this world. You're going to have to set it right. Free yourself from these hidden chains. I call those hidden chains. The big chains we can see, just the hidden chains. You ever walk it? You know, you see, I've done it before myself. I've walked across a floor that was not finished with construction looking for the planks that are not nailed down and looking at the walls and the sheet rock and this, that, and the other. And then a nail that was not quite hammered down hits the front of my shoe, makes me fall to the ground and look like an idiot. That little tiny nail took me down. See, I was focused on the big stuff. But it's always that little thing that can stop you in your tracks. You ever stub your pinky toe? That stops you in your tracks. You see the big stuff and you avoid it. But then you hit your little pinky toe and it stops you in your tracks. You will stop in your tracks. Those small chains, the ones that people can hardly see, those can be the ones that make you fall flat on your face. They're sneaky chains, like putting your expectation in humans and mankind. Some of those chains are passed on from your parents. They raised you a certain way. Some with hard work ethic, right? Some with not so hard work ethic. But what portions of that line up with the Word? You see, that's the, the, the Bible is, should be the center of everything that you do. That's why I can't afford not to study it. I can't afford not to meditate on it. I, I just simply can't afford to. Because I would absolutely be lost without instruction from the Word. I look around. You, all you have to do is observe the news and read articles and you'll see mankind has messed everything up. They're always promising, but it never works. And if it does work, it's temporary. We know this. God is finite. We all do that. There's nothing we, thing we can do of ourselves that perpetuates itself. It's caused damage. Do battle, hurt people's hearts, and everything else. Everything evil we can do with ease. But the good things we attempt to establish are fleeting to us. Because only God's principles and His ways are permanent. Our ways are temporary. And if you're doing something that's not established in his word, it, it could be pleading. When you're looking around at world events, please gauge the world by the words of our Lord and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be okay. You've all, listen, you've been promised the victory by the creator of all things. You're a child of the creator of all things. He constantly looks at you. So you cannot be shaken by other things he by the way nothing can exist without his approval even the fallen angels were created by him and they have lines they cannot cross with you but you see they can cross lines with those here's a deceptive thing i need to explain to you anybody who does not belong to jesus christ they're walking around without protection no armor and and no authority there is a whim of these fallen angels they can be destroyed by them they can be manipulated and everything else. They can be killed by them. Here's the trick Satan does. He says, okay, I know this, but what I've got to do is implant some people in the body of Christ 
who are mine so that when something happens and they're destroyed through their destruction, I can deplete the faith of everybody who befriended them. Now, is that not a sneaky tactic? What did the Lord say? Would not have a sacred concerning the devices of the enemy. And I'm telling you now, I've seen the same tactic work over and over again. He will implant one of his into the body of Christ, and that will be the one the scriptures will not work for. And because they don't work for him and you're observing, you lose your faith, not knowing who this person was. A wolf in sheep's clothing will suffer the punishment of a wolf from his master. But you're a sheep, you're not going to suffer the punishment of the wolf. Satan is trying to trick everybody to think there's no power in the name of Jesus. There's no power in prayer. There's no power in believing in God, period. And you know what's sad? He's accomplishing what he set out to do. He has sown so many seeds a long time ago of things that are just not biblically found. And when they do not work, people get they begin to question their own salvation. Don't fall for that stuff. One of the greatest deceptions Satan can sing your way is to think that your faith is void. That's one of the greatest deceptions he'll sing your way, to make you think your faith is void. Your faith is not void, but it's working. And many will fall away from the faith. There'll be a great falling away. Don't let him fool you like that. Satan has many tricks up his sleeve. The Holy Spirit can expose them all. So does the Gospels of Jesus Christ to expose them all. We just have to be diligent in our study, believing what we read, rightly divining the word of truth. And then ask your daddy, ask your daddy, if you don't understand something, say, hey, I need an answer for this. Don't let it fester or linger. Go get your answer. Get your answer. Because things are forming. And the fact is people are getting scared. People are being consumed into this movement of ISIS because of faith. You see, they're scared that if they turn away from the faith, God will hate them too. So they join ISIS. If ISIS was dismembered right now, if they were disbanded right now, that same thought would perpetuate itself. Somebody else would pick up the cause. And if they were destroyed, somebody else is going to pick up the cause. It's going to perpetuate itself. But our focus is to understand these things. We know these things are coming. Don't put it in a box and think everything is going to be conventional. We know these things are coming. But what will it take for us to stay firm in our walk? How do you gauge yourself in your walk, by the way? Well, reflect on today. Did you have a victory today in the words of our Lord? Or did you have a failure? And if you did fail and you did repent, did you also ask the Lord to strengthen you in that area so that you won't do it again? Or did you just simply repent and hope you don't do it again? We have to learn to hate something, to leave it alone. In most cases, we don't like pain, and so that keeps us away from a great many things. In a lot of cases, we don't like discomfort, so then we begin to take precautions. Sin, small sins, big sins, whatever sins, in many cases, we have to learn what it actually destroys before we let it go. Because just like that house, reflecting on how beautiful it is and this, that, and the other, the wonders of a house, because you're being, you have to move out of it. We do that with the world. We still marvel over things in the world that can draw us back. And because the Lord said, we're tempted and drawn away of our own lusts, then we have something to pray about. That's also a little chain, a little hidden chain. Many think by speaking, they're done with something. They're done with it, right? Well, if it's not in their hearts, they didn't ask the Father to remove that thing from them. Satan can still use that to draw you back into temptation. Your own internal lusts draw you away back into those areas. But are we praying that the Lord actually remove them? He's given us the victory in him. We have the victory by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We have the victory. We have the victory. Now we have to endure until the end. And so throughout the rest of the week, we're going to have another balanced week. I like to balance things between strange, some of the obvious, but always telling you what the word, who the word says you are, not who you think you are, but who God said you are to him. You know what matters? It's who you are to him that matters. He's the creator. Let's get that in our heads. He's the boss, the big man, but he's also our father. There are no other gods before him. 
He runs the whole show. If something were not to be permitted, it's just not going to exist, period. All things work together for good, for the good of them that love the Lord, that are called according to his purpose. That means anything bad that happens to you is going to be used for your good. And guess what? God glories in his children. To bring God glory brings you glory. It brings you joy in everything else. You are his child. You are his child. Not Satan's child. His child. Satan's children are easy to identify. They don't speak the language of humility, meekness, mercy, compassion, love, the blood of the Lamb, forgiveness. They don't speak that language. The language they speak is just like ISIS. They defy. They don't believe in the merciful God. They don't believe in a compassionate God. They don't subscribe to forgiveness. They don't. They go against Jesus Christ. It's easy to hear who is and who's not one of your real brothers and sisters because your brothers and sisters speak the language found in the Gospels of Jesus Christ in its totality, not its partial language. And if God is love, and if you are his seed, within you is a seed of love, his type love, not the world's love. His type love is in you. If you are a seed of God, then a seed of love is within you because the Bible says God is love, his type love. Not the corrupted, perverted love that the world presents to you. The language of people who are not your brothers and sisters is not easily hid. Because the Lord did say one day, all those things in the dark will be brought to the light. You know who he was talking about? A lot of people mess up when they read that. He's going to expose the real enemy. If they're wolf in sheep's clothing, he said he would expose that. He would. That means you would know. You see, you can have a stumbling brother or sister. They're still your brother and sister. They just stumble and do strange things. But guess what? They still still speak the language of the blood of the Lamb, compassion, mercy, meekness, humility. They have the traits of one of the children of God. But a wolf, they don't have those traits. They speak softly, but they demand. See, they can't hide themselves anymore. All the wolves are beginning to demand, go kill them. They can't hide themselves. That's what they're demanding. All the wolves are saying, go get them, go kill them. They need to pay right now. No mercy. That's how a predator operates. You are not a predator. You don't go around hunting the sheep. See, a predator hunts the sheep. But one sheep will certainly console another. They speak a different language. You see that in the New Testament all the time. What did the Pharisees do go around doing? They, they went around as predators, hunting. Right? But they did. They listened to everything, but they went around as predators, hunting, trying to kill Jesus. They tried to kill Jesus. Now, all they wanted to do was go around. They were hunting him. Listen, the, the wolves in sheep's clothing, they hunt. They hunt people down is what they do. They have, that, they have that nature. And some of those seeds that they have within them, some of those seeds are seeds of Satan. You see, there are two seeds in this world. Seeds of God, seeds of Satan. No, the seeds of Satan cannot be redeemed because you have no idea what they are. Seeds of Satan are not simply um, just normal people. You were born with a... With a uh, you had compassion in you. Even the worst of us, even the worst of us who had to do the war thing, we still had compassion. We didn't take pride in killing folks. Even a bank robber who was the seed of God regret deeply what he did. He was caught up in the moment of whatever and probably said, I deserve this. Because humility and meekness will do that to you, but they're all coming home, all of them. And the wolves that were with us, they can't help themselves. They have to hunt their predator. That's an easy way to identify. But but listen, the Lord is taking their that sheep's clothing off of them. All of them will be exposed. And this is why you see the Middle East going rampant because they can't hide who they were anymore. All the violence that is coming, and listen to me, violence will begin to take over the earth. Parts of iniquity will abound because they will no longer be able to hide what was sitting deep within them. Consequently, those things that slept in the children of God will also awaken things you've not experienced before. A boldness you can't identify with right now. You see, as the world increases with its violence, so will things increase in you. When the Lord said, you will get the victory, 
That's exactly what he meant, which means you're going to be armed, protected, hidden, or whatever it takes for you to have the victory. That's why you shouldn't worry. But some of us have people we love who we found out were seeds of Satan, and it's difficult to accept that. Some of us have people we love who are very close to slipping off the edge. Some of us have friends that we love that have committed suicide. Some of us have friends that we love who lead a very destructive life and it's getting worse. But let me tell you something. If they belong to the Father, He will orchestrate the events in their life to save their souls. He will do that. What we have to do is endure everything until the end so that we can be beneficial. Those things we have to endure to the end are largely spiritual in nature. That's why it also said in Revelation, they will behold the beast that was, is not, but yet is. And see, I wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and the foundations of the world. There's only one thought that comes to mind when I read that scripture. You know what it is? They're going to behold something ancient, yet something that is around, the spirit is around, and it's coming in the form of that thing. And they're going to wonder, are we from that thing or are we from God? In other words, here it comes. They're going to wonder if, were, if they were ever human at all. Just as you have a seed in you of compassion, these seeds of Satan, I'm telling you, their language is very different. But the moment you start speaking about Jesus Christ, they will cut company with you and leave. They don't want to hear it. They never, ever want to hear it. They would die first before they had to listen about Jesus. They don't want to hear it. And because the things in the dark are going to be brought to the light, they can no longer hide. No one's going to be able to hide who they really are. It's like an actor being fired. Now it's time to be your real self. Your real self is surfacing. That's what's happening to everybody. These, these Islamic folks, the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because they can't hide who they are. China doing barrel rolls over our carriers, causing us to send more carrier groups out there. They can't hide who they are. People, nations who have set silent, people who have set silent, are finally showing who they are. Your predatory nature won't go away. Did you not know that royalty is not a predator? When you're a royal person, you're a very wise person. You're not out hunting anything. But the wolves, they have to hunt. Remember that. They speak a different language. If you can begin to recognize the language that they speak, you'll never be entangled with them. They can show compassion, make it show love and everything else, but listen, they do not speak your language. You start talking about humility, listen at their conversation, listen for humility. Not what they said they did themselves, but how they react to situations, and you'll see it, because they cannot hide it. Their internal nature is to let's go get it. It's becoming painfully obvious that a lot of people close to us are in that. So I say this, because I know it's coming. When those close to you guys in the room, people start falling away, comfort each other. I know for a fact that there are many in people's families that could fall away. Their children could fall away. And anyone who falls away from the faith is essentially has been exposed for who they really were. Those are the wolves. They can no longer hide themselves. They will abandon the faith. But a lot of people are going to be shocked as to who they are. You could potentially be the only one in your family that is made the way you are. The ratio is astounding. I've done grand numbers, and the ratio I keep coming up with is astounding. It's not good. I can see why the word remnant was used. People are being consumed by all sorts of ideas, but I can tell you this. Anybody with God's seed within them will hear the voice of Jesus Christ. They'll hear his voice in the Bible. They will hear his voice coming through a real minister's mouth. They will understand and hear his gospel. They're going to hear his voice. You know what Jesus said? My sheep hear my voice. And you can hear his voice in a lot of places. And then there are a lot of places you don't hear his voice, yet you continue to listen anyway. Be careful of that too. If you don't hear the words that Jesus was speaking based upon his principles, that's not his voice. You can recognize the gospel because it bears witness to your soul. But I caution you, when you're listening to things that do not bear witness to your soul, you need to back off. Don't sit there and entertain it. You need to back off because I'll share with you again. Sometimes Satan could take us down a highway that only consumes our life and does not add anything to it. Uh, you know what? You see people like that now. You know what they're doing? 
They're trying to find out the origins of UFOs. They spend their whole life to attempt to find the origin of UFOs. And those same little crafts are described in the Bible. That's all they had to do. But you see, the problem is Satan has enchanted them. He beguiled them. They think they're from, from the, the, the uh, planet Lasagna. And they have to go find them. And then they want to contact them, not knowing those things are in contact with people all the time. You see? Useless stuff. But I'll tell you again, I'll tell you this out of experience. If I ever see one, I will rebuke it. You see, I found out something. If you rebuke something in the name of Jesus and define what Jesus you're talking about, things have to go. If it's from the Lord, anything from the Lord in the Bible, what does it do? It identifies itself, doesn't it? It doesn't sit up there to cause a mystery because good angels do not want to be worshipped. They're going to tell you they're a servant of the Lord like you are. They don't want to be worshipped. Only the dark ones come around and mystify you and then poof, they're gone. But what kind of stuff is that? That's to make you wonder and to make you worship. And they always present themselves as an angel of light. See, an angel is a messenger. If it's a messenger, it did not or originate from earth. And so these fallen angels, they beguile people with the big shift. And worst, they share the technology with humankind once again as they did prior to the flood. And then they beguile humankind thinking, yes, we're just like you are. And then they start a war. I'll tell you what, above all things, I stand on my faith because I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because I know God is with me. You know what's important? That you know he's with you. The only way you can know he's with you is if you examine everything that happens in your life. And if you do that, you'll walk into true liberty. You never thought, because you can see him working all around you. The trust factor goes, whoop, I mean, it goes off the scale. I love my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I do know for a fact that without him, there's no way I can survive what I have survived, nor can I survive what's coming. Because what's coming attacks the hope. And no one wants to be in a position to where you're hopeless. Because when you've lost your hope, you will yield to any greater power in front of you. That's why a lot of people are going to accept the mark of the beast. No matter what the mark of the beast is, they're going to accept it because it's going to be a greater power they have not experienced. Prior to the mark of the beast, there will be some type of war. There are going to be things like that. But because they, they're, they're, the attack is on your hope, Begin to examine the small things in your life so that you can see if you examine the small things in your life, you'll begin to see the Lord's hand in something. Have you ever been to the point where you said, Lord, I just want you to show me yourself? But here's a question. Did you pay attention? He's done that. There's nobody alive being a Christian has walked through so many things. And once they examine the scriptures, they cannot deny that the Lord showed up in their lives. His promises are active. God's word is active. He has given you warnings. He has guided you in some places, that small, still voice that will say, don't go there. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. You've heard those warnings. That's him. Satan, because he enchants, because he beguiles, he always has to present his side of the story. And he normally, he looks into you and says, what does this person want? And the very thing you want is what he attempts to conform things to to get to you. In other words, Satan gives you exactly what you want at that time. It blows up in your face, but that's what he gives you. Our God does not work that way. You have to seek him and examine things to see his fingerprint. But here's what most people don't know. His eyes, his heart, everything is continually upon his children. Continually. He sees and knows everything we do, think about everything else. He loves us. Satan attempts to beguile us. Peter is there watching when Satan approaches because he permits it in the first place. Satan can't go as far as he wants to go. He just simply can't do it. Do, do you know what that means? That means even a demon cannot do, if they can only go so far with you. The Lord's not going to allow anything to come in your life that's going to consume you. That is absolute protection. When you know that he will never, ever allow Satan to do anything or any spirit or any person do anything that will consume you, that's awesome. He's not going to let that happen. He is watching you grow. He's helping in that fact. 
Maybe that's why it was written, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. And by the way, you are called according to his purpose, because if God had not given you to Jesus, you wouldn't know him. And Jesus said, it is God's will that he not lose any of you. That is just, that's awesome. That's mind-blowing. You're in absolute security, absolute protection, capable hands, and your Father is the creator of the universe, and your Savior is the Son of the creator of, the, of everything. Where then is fear? What will we be afraid of? Where's fear? And when the Spirit pours out, some of you who thought you would have fear, you won't be able to identify with it anymore. Once you purge yourself of something, you have a hard time identifying it. Someone will say, oh, I'm scared, and you'll have a hard time understanding or, or even remembering what that felt like. He has no desire anyone perishing. He's merciful. The stench has to reach his nose. And so violence will only come because that dividing line that hid people from who they really are is being taken away. It's almost like a spirit of compliment has come into the earth. And let me explain that. Whatever you are is being amplified internally. See, when something is amplified, it overtakes everything else. So who you really are is being amplified. And all the facades, all the wolves, the, the uh, sheep's clothing and everything else is being taken away. And so the only thing left is who we really are. Who we really are is being exposed. For us, that means greater compassion. That means an absence of fear. That means humility with power. That's a subject within itself because in humility and meekness is true power. That spirit has entered the earth. Everything is being uncovered before a lot of people violence is in the earth. And then that stench of that wickedness and violence and iniquity is going to reach the nostrils of God. And he's going to say, that is it. He's going to tell his son to go. And because he said he's coming in an hour that we know not, some people are still going to be on their calculators trying to determine when he's coming. Then you know what? I found something. Things are happening. And you know what? This is why when I see iniquity and violence rise in the world, I feel different. I feel different inside because that stench is going to reach the nostrils of God himself. In fact, that's why he looked down upon his land in the first place and remembered his land. Now, he already knows about his land. That's like saying when the noise level in the kindergarten gets too high, everybody's in trouble. We're coming to a point. And certainly no one can hide who they really are anymore. This is why you see the violence rising in the streets. Viruses rising within people causing, they're only rooting fear. They're, they, all this stuff is orchestrated, not by mankind. Some of it may be man, but all of it's going to be used to your benefit. When people are exposed, when the stench goes up, then it's time. But it's happening right now. It's amazing it's happening right now. It's happening right now. You know and I know that people are being exposed for who they are. They can't hide under these fake faces anymore. You're being exposed. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemy. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.